Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our session entitled Encryption's Critical Role in Safeguarding Human Rights. Thank you for being here at 8.30 Japan time and all other times you may be logging in. Uh, we appreciate it. My name is Al Smith. I work at the Tor Project and I'll be the room facilitator today. As you know, this is a hybrid session, so there are gonna be some panelists participating online um, and they're gonna be these two right here with me. I'm, I'm pretty excited about our panel today because we've brought together some experts from the tech, policy, human rights, and advocacy spaces to talk about a handful of policy issues and uncover some key elements for a human rights forward governance framework for encryption. Online today, um, I'm not seeing them show up on the screen, so I don't know if I should introduce them now. I'll talk about who we have here in person and then hopefully uh, our online people will appear on the screen for whoever's doing that. Um, in person we have Roger Dinkeldine, who is the president and co-founder of the Tor Project. And we also have Sharon Polsky, president of the Privacy and Access Council of Canada. I don't see the people online, but I'll introduce them anyway. Um, we also have Rand Hamoud, the surveillance campaigner from Access Now, and Tate Ryan Mosley, the senior tech policy reporter for MIT Technology Review. And Tate is gonna be our online moderator today. So I was thinking I could toss it to um, the folks in the room to just say a sentence about what you do and where you're based. Uh, do a quick introduction and then we'll get into the meat of the conversation. Um, actually, I wanna talk about the structure of the conversation quickly before we do that. We're gonna have 30 to 35 minutes of structured, moderated convo, and then we'll take questions both from the online space and here in the room. Um, and we will end at, the, at 9.30. So I'm gonna hand it to Roger and then we'll go to Sharon, and then we'll go to Round, and then Tate, and then we'll take off the conversation. So Roger, could you just say a few words about who you are and where you're from? Okay, hi everybody, the microphone works, great. I'm Roger Dingledine from the Tor Project. Uh, Tor is a, a privacy nonprofit in the US, based in the US. We write software to keep people safer on the internet. Uh, we care about the uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, surveillance resistance, and we also care about the censorship resistance side of things. So um, originally I wrote Tor, and now I wear all sorts of hats, including talking to policy people and law enforcement and governments and hacker conferences and so on. Good morning. I'm Sharon Polsky from Canada. I am the president of the Privacy and Access Council of Canada. A uh, nonprofit, not affiliated with government, completely independent organization that represents the data protection professionals uh, in Canada and beyond, and offers a professional certification program. And we also have uh, written a variety of standards, con collaborated in some, and written the certification, uh, the um, the standard for competency for people who are data protection professionals, and a big part of what we do is education both of our members, of legislators, of the general public, because it all ties together with matters that we will be discussing today and that have been discussed throughout this forum. Let's go to Rand next. Thanks, Al. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Hamoud from Lebanon. I'm a surveillance campaigner at Access Now. Access Now is a digital rights organization aiming at defending and extending the digital rights of people and communities at risk. I lead our global campaigns on spyware and surveillance technologies, and I'm very excited to be talking to you today on this panel. And finally, Tate. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tate Ryan Mosley. I am the senior tech policy reporter at MIT Technology Review. Um, what that means is I cover the emerging technologies that are changing government uh, policy and politics and how we participate as citizens in those activities. I'm also really excited to moderate the panel today. 
Thank you, Tate. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, that sounds great. So um, I'm going to very briefly set the scene for our chat um, to give some basics, because we are talking about some more sophisticated technology. I know I like these sorts of primers. Um, so basically, uh, encryption is a technology that allows people to keep their information and activities private online by scrambling messages um, through mathematical cryptography and algorithms. Um, often, when we talk about encryption today, we're talking about end-to-end -end encryption. And that means that you know when a sender first sends a message, it gets encrypted and sent as cipher text. And then the receiver has to decrypt it to read the message in plain text. And so with end-to-end -end encryption, even the tech companies that make encrypted apps, uh, apps actually do not have the keys, um, as they would call it, to break the cipher text. But more on that later. Um, most commonly, when we talk about end-to-end -end encryption for the average internet user, we're talking about messaging apps like Signal, Telegram, and WhatsApp. But there are different variations of encryption. So HTTPS, for example, protects websites and website activities. And even some devices are fully encrypted by um, uh, with passwords and passcodes, like an iPhone, for example. Um, and encryption has actually been debated from a policy perspective really since the beginning of time for 20 or 30 years, as authorities have sought access to encrypted messages and devices. Um, this access is commonly called a backdoor, and authorities um, or law enforcement agencies that have advocated for backdoor access um, often will say, you know, we just want access to some messages on a case-by-case, -case, restricted, small-scale targeted allowance. Um, in the past, of course, tech companies argue that doing so would have pretty substantial risks to encryption as a whole, because the creation of a sort of master key, which doesn't exist today, would be really hard to control from bad actors, inappropriate government uses, and just generally weaken encryption. Um, opponents of backdoor access say that, of course, law enforcement can't really be trusted with this type of access, plus it's not really how the technology works. Um, and additionally, strong encryption is necessary for human rights advocates, journalists, and free speech more generally. Um, historically, the UN has actually sided on the, on the side of the opponents of backdoor access, saying that encryption backdoors are contrary to the freedom of expression. So in the past, we've seen the encryption debate pop up really during times of crisis when law enforcement agencies are looking for a particular piece of intelligence in a high profile case like the San Bernardino shootings in the US or the Paris bombings, um, both of those in 2015. But currently we're seeing this debate crop up in the form of online safety and content moderation, most commonly. Um, there've been a handful of bills in the US and globally, um, US at the state level, but also Australia, UK, places, you know, Canada, that we'll talk a little bit about today um, that are threatening encryption. So we're gonna talk about all of this today um, in light of also the growing use of surveillance technologies by governments around the world and what we might do to strengthen encryption protections. So as a reminder, we will have some time for questions at the end. So please do think of them throughout our chat um, so that you're ready to shoot them out to our lovely panelists um, at the end of this. So now that we're, you know, kind of all on the same page about what we're talking about, I want to pass the first question to Roger, which is, Roger, why do governments, law enforcement agencies, anybody really want backdoor access? What are they getting at? Yeah, so that's a, a broad question. I mean, the, the fundamental uh, conflict here is between society being safe and uh, national intelligence, law enforcement, uh, governments wanting control in these cases. So the, the way that I look at this is, uh, the question is about privacy, and by privacy I mean uh, control or choice about your information. So if you are successfully having privacy, uh, and one of the ways to get that is through the, this encryption that we're talking about, uh, then you get to choose who learns things about you. So that's my definition of privacy, and, uh, and one of the interesting characteristics of it is vulnerable populations uh, need it more, find it more valuable. So if you already have a lot of power, if you're a nation state or uh, Russian mafia or whatever uh, large powerful group, uh, you already have power. It's not so important for you to have uh, an extra layer of privacy. Whereas if you're a uh, minority, LGBT, journalist, uh, human rights activist, uh, and so on, then it's much 
uh, then this is one of the most important things for you to retain control of your own safety. Yeah, and um, Roger, kind of sticking with you on that point, when governments or law enforcement agencies, um, you know, whatever party is in control, asks for backdoor access to encryption, from a technical point of view, why is that a slippery slope? Like, why is that such a risky request? Yeah, so there are, there are several problems here. One of, the, one of the big problems is math doesn't know what country it's in. Technology doesn't know what country it's in. So if you, let's say you have a, a country with perfect rule of law, I don't, I don't know where you'd find one of those, but let's say you have one of those. Uh, and in that situation, the judicial process gets to decide uh, who can break the encryption and whose uh, messages we'll look at. Uh, that same tool is going to be used elsewhere in the world, and there are other countries who are going to try to reuse the same uh, mechanism for, for breaking the encryption. So even if in the US we had a perfect judicial system, which we don't, what do the tech companies do? What do the tools do when the judge in Saudi Arabia asks for that same access? So the fact that there are different countries in the world uh, is one of the one of the main challenges to, uh, to having this whole backdoor concept make any sense at all. And I guess the other way of saying that is uh, this notion of a backdoor that law enforcement keeps asking for weakens society as a whole. It makes everybody less safe. And that, that's not a worthwhile trade-off. Mm -hmm. Rond, I want to pass it to you um, because you work with protecting free expression and you know people on the ground who are doing human rights work. How have you seen encryption being used to protect activists or even citizens who are just expressing their voices? Thanks, Tate. I think one of the main things that comes up uh, when it comes to encryption and protecting or safeguarding or enabling even fundamental rights is the fact that it is one of the biggest technologies today that is the foundation of security and safety and trust online. And so it's enabled activists, lawyers, uh, human rights defenders, dissidents to securely communicate, organize, uh, and protect their freedom of expression and assembly. And so if we go ahead and undermine encryption, we are thus undermining their ability to do so. And we need to place this conversation within the context of an already pervasive surveillance industry where even with strong encryptions, and even when we do have data that is now encrypted and safe, uh, we already have a large billion dollar industry that is working day in and day out to find vulnerabilities to exploit and already survey these individuals and place them at risk and thus putting them in harm's way and even causing and enabling grievous human rights abuses such as enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings. And so the conversation around safeguarding encryption needs to also be aware of the already existing surveillance capabilities of governments and malicious actors. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And, um, one thing, Sharon, I want to ask you about is even from an economic perspective, um, encryption is essential to data protection activities at normal businesses, right? So yes, as Roger spoke about, you know, you have these grave power, you know, imbalances between activists and states, but also you have, you know, people at their jobs who are protecting sensitive information who rely on encryption. Can you talk about that use case as well a little bit? Absolutely, and you're, you're right. It's not just the human rights people and the, the advocates, but it is every day people in business. And the one area that is seldom mentioned is also the lawmakers themselves. Whether you are a lawyer who has to maintain client confidentiality, or you're a doctor and you have to maintain confidentiality of your patient information, if you're a lawmaker, a strategist, a policy analyst, and you're in discussion with your colleagues, you don't want somebody else being able to infiltrate and figure out what you are strategizing. So everybody has privacy issues, whether it's for personal privacy or for business and economic and actually for national security reasons. Maintaining encryption is absolutely fundamental. Mm. Yeah, and I think, um, Rond, I want to pass it back to you. You know, we're in a 
a room, I'm sure with some policymakers at a policy making conference. Um, how do you think we should respond to governments who you know, want backdoor access to uh, encrypted technologies and who kind of stands to gain and, and who stands to lose? Do you trust them? I think to piggyback on my, what my fellow panelists just said, I mean, undermining encryption is also a national security issue. And so when you look at it that way, no one stands to gain. It will place, you know, national governments at risk, the same governments that want to or are advocating for undermining encryption will be themselves at risk. And then, you know, democratic processes are including are included within those risks because when you think about journalists, activists, uh, essential uh, people that uphold democratic processes being at risk or uh, having to self-censor because they know that they could be surveyed in such a way uh, that is mass scale, really, when you talk about undermining encryption, then that whole process is 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 lost. And so I think from my point of view, there is no one uh, left to gain except you know, individuals or malicious actors who want to survey those people and who want to gain access and, you know, who want to exercise population control because essentially that is what undermining encryption will do. It will make surveillance so much cheaper. It will take us into, you know, pre-Snowden revelation days when, you know, there was mass surveillance from governments and companies. Uh, and so there is no one to gain. There is no one that is going to gain and is um, we shouldn't be trusting uh, backdoor accesses or any sort of uh, pretext that really are not even technologically sound. Mm, yeah, and I feel like you're picking up on one kind of key tension that has been in this narrative for a long time, which is, you know, our security and privacy opposing things. Can we have both? How do you achieve both? Um, and Roger, I wanted I wanted your perspective on that. Like, to what extent is this binary of security and privacy real? Yeah, so security and privacy are the same thing in a lot of ways. Imagine you give out your financial data and then somebody does identity theft on you. So going back to your example of uh, encryption being a national security thing, I was at an FBI conference years ago and the, I talked to a bunch of FBI people and some of them use Tor and some of them fear Tor. And one guy was saying, uh, surely you have some sort of backdoor, right? Surely you have some way to learn what people are doing on the Tor network. And I explained to him, I pointed to his colleagues and said, these people just told me today that they use Tor and rely on Tor every day for their job. Do you want mm. me to have a way to learn what they're doing on the internet? So from that perspective, it's a, it's a national security, it's a security, it's a privacy. They're all the same, uh, they're all the same sides of, of the same coin. Mm. Yeah, Sharon, do you wanna expand on that? I have to agree with Roger, it is all connected and it's all too often that people will talk about one aspect or another without relating, without connecting the dots and you absolutely have to. But the problem I've found through my career and that's been dealing with governments and policy people and corporations, there's been very little education about these things. We use the internet, we use computers, but a lot of people Unless you live it, unless you're a Roger and you design these protective mechanisms, uh, uh, most people just use them. And that's a problem because they know how to use it to a, a very small degree. They don't understand the implications of what they're doing quite often. And that also falls over to the lawmakers and the people who prepare the research and the briefing notes for the lawmakers if they don't understand what the technology is about, what the risks really are, and the unintended consequences of the legislation they draft, then they are building something that is going to create a world of problems. And for that, I look to things like various pieces of legislation in Canada. Some have just come in, some are still on the books being debated and the online, so-called Online Safety Act in Britain, that is, they're all being promulgated as necessary to protect children, and doesn't everybody want to protect children? That's the argument. 
Of course we want to protect children. They are among the most vulnerable. But if you undermine encryption to ostensibly protect children, other people will also be able to get through that back door and endanger not only the children but everybody else. And it is the very children who will be endangered because the way the laws are being written, the content will have to be scoured automatically, proactively, automatically reported to police if it is suspected as potentially, maybe, possibly being child sexual abuse material. So what happens when a child has been abused and wants to report? Their content gets stopped and reported, and they are the ones who become the suspects. In Canada, a child is chargeable under the Criminal Code of Canada as of 12 years old. Imagine the possibilities and the unintended consequences of breaking encryption. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And I want to get a little bit further into the specifics here, because I think, you know, this is where we're hearing a lot of the encryption debate. Um, of, you know, if we have a lot of encrypted messaging, if we have a lot of really secure portals for communications, we can't moderate those spaces. And we know that internet users are increasingly moving to private spaces in this age of, in this current, you know, moment of social media. And so lawmakers are saying, hey, you know, what can we do about all this abuse information? What can we do about, you know, all of this, you know, bad, harmful content that's being passed through people that, that tech companies themselves and governments have no visibility into. And you brought up the UK online safety bill. This was obviously a big one. Australia, India, the US, we've also seen some discussions of, you know, uh, providing either technical or real backdoor access to uh, encrypted messages. I'd love to know, Sharon, like, can you tell me something kind of specific about some of the bills in Canada where you see, you know, an unintended consequence or a um, misunderstanding from lawmakers of, you know, the technology or the ramifications? Absolutely. I, and really, I don't have the imagination to make up the stories, the examples that I will cite. I had a conversation with one of our current members of parliament about a year ago. We were talking about this because the legislation in Canada was just being formulated. And I said, but if you break encryption for some so that all the content can be monitored, and she stopped me and kind of went, break encryption? No, I don't think that's how it works, and changed the subject. She, like many of our current members of parliament, come from journalism. They're educated, they're worldly, that's great, but they don't get it. Uh, we have, now you might have heard of Bill C-18 that just became law to update the Broadcast Act. And that sounds wonderful, except it in now includes not just radio and television, but it includes governing the internet globally. Canada ta has taken it upon themselves to declare that they will govern the content. Combine that with another piece of legislation on the books, Bill C-26, uh, and we refer to them by their numbers because unlike the United States, Canada has um, a history of creating legislation with very lengthy, hard to say names, not nice, concise, easily said acronyms. So Bill C-26 is another piece of legislation and that one is going to amend the Telecommunications Act to create the Critical Cyber Systems Protection Act. Um, and like the others, it'll infringe on privacy and freedom. All of these will narrow identified gaps. They do, if you look at it from a certain perspective, have a legitimate application, protecting children, preventing terrorism, preventing all the ills and harms that we see so often, the, the very same things that were going on long before the internet became a thing. Um, but the problem is, everything is going to be surveilled. As Rand said, that is a problem, particularly because when everything is surveilled and the various pieces of legislation say, some content we will deem, we will have our separate agencies deem as misinformation, disinformation, unwanted content. The government will not be the one to do the censoring. The law will have the platforms 
do the automatic, uh, routine, mandatory, proactive screening. Those are outside of Canada, outside of the reach of Canadian law, of course. So it's, it's actually a very, a very interesting way that they've created it because similar to the Americans who have uh, constitutional rights to freedom of speech, we have charter and protected right to freedom of expression and the charter protects Canadians against overreach by government. So it's not gonna be the government committing overreach, it's going to be the companies that the charter doesn't cover. The companies will just do as the law requires and that affects everybody, including everything from children to the elderly in every walk of life, including the politicians themselves. And on that point, I mean, um, luckily for us, we have someone on this panel who runs a tech company. Roger, um, how do you think about balancing privacy with c content moderation? I mean, I know this is not the tour projects, you know, bread and butter, uh, uh, bread and butter. But um, you know, we do know that there have been the proliferation of you know child sexual abuse material on some private messaging apps. So, you know, is there an approach that balances these two things? Can you achieve some level of moderation and encrypted privacy? Yeah, so fortunately, Tor is a communications tool, not one of these platforms. So we don't have content to moderate in the way that Facebook and so on have. Uh, but from, from the, so everything Sharon said is right, but it's worse than that. Because you were talking about uh, if the technology behaves in a perfect way, then it's still bad for society. But the reality is, uh, for example, in the UK online safety bill, they're imagining there will be magic AI machines that perfectly dis look at pictures and perfectly decide correctly if they're bad pictures or not bad pictures. And the reality is uh, AI doesn't work that way. It's not perfect. You're going to have some false positives. And let's say you have 2% of the time it says that's a bad picture uh, and it shouldn't. And there are 10 billion pictures being sent each day. Uh, then 2% of the users are gonna get reported each day for being criminals, and maybe they can drive the false positive rate from 2% down to 1%, so now it's only uh, tens of thousands of people being misreported and having their lives ruined because the, the math uh, screwed up a little bit for them. So uh, it, it's definitely a challenge here because uh, the politicians want this reality to be possible. And it isn't, but they want it to be possible. And there are uh, all sorts of for-profit tech shark scam companies that say, oh yes, 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 give me millions of dollars and I'll build a magic thing for you and it will be magic. And the reality is it's not going to work. It's not going to do what, what people want. Uh, but the politicians really want it. They, they, they would love to have a, uh, a technology solution to be able to give people privacy while also uh, surveilling all of them. But the reality is that, that the tech does not support uh, the things that they're wanting. Yeah, and just some context if people aren't familiar, these are, you know, I, I'm sure you're referring to a handful of technologies. Some are, you know, message franking, client side scanning, server side scanning, and really the idea behind these types of technologies, they are different, so I'm sorry for painting with a, bo a broad brush here, um, are technologies that basically allow a machine to evaluate the content underneath the encryption so that there's not a person you know, reviewing necessarily the content of encrypted messages, but there's a machine checking and saying, oh, you know, this might be child sex abuse material, for example. And in the UK law, you know, it was a stipulation of the UK online safety bill that, you know, um, technically feasible, I think was the terminology they used, you know, um, had to use those type of technologies. And then it was recently, just a month ago, repealed because the technologies do not exist or, or change. That part of the, the bill was changed. Um, and I, I, I really like, Roger, how you said, you know, let's talk about reality today. And Rhonda, I want to pass this back to you. So talking about reality today, what sort of protections do human rights advocates, journalists need right now when it comes to, you know, protecting their own privacy and protecting themselves against government surveillance? So I think there are 
two main two main subjects to this kind of answer and when it comes to protecting themselves from government surveillance it mainly takes us into the idea that you know be, even before we get into undermining um, encryption we already are in a space where spyware is largely used against uh you know human rights activists dissidents etc and with the most recent reports that Amnesty put out, it's become even cheaper today. Um, for example, a predator infection costs 9,000 euros only, uh, when years ago it was much, much more expensive. And so the technology is proliferating and it is off the shelf. It is unregulated, unchecked, and governments and who knows what other actors are just using it against, uh, against uh, human rights activists, lawyers, journalists. And so the first, the first thing that we need to tackle or the governments need to tackle is firstly ban spyware vendors and technologies that have already been used to enable human rights abuses. And then talk about establishing the safeguards that are needed in order to have a more human rights respecting framework to use certain uh, digital surveillance technologies in a way that does not infringe on human rights, if that, if that framework exists. But we first need to be able to uh, have multiple multiple safeguards that would ensure that even if these technologies are used there is you know a, a mechanism to access remedy uh, a mechanism for investigations etc which largely even in spaces that it exists today is not respected uh, and we see that uh, where you know there are multiple democracies where there are legal frameworks that deem the surveillance illegitimate but it is still happening and so the conversation around the protections, the legal protections that we need should also look into why the technology is pro proliferating in such a way and the pretext behind why it exists or the need behind why it exists. And, you know, the pretext that law enforcement needs this kind of technology today to ensure, you know, that everyone is safe is completely false. Uh, we have not seen any evidence that this technology has helped in any way to maintain national security or make anyone safe, but we have plenty of evidence of it making people less and less safe and infringing on their rights. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, a really interesting point. Um, and Roger, I, I want to pass it back to you. I mean, so you know, what can tech companies do and how are tech companies responding to um, both, I would say, increased surveillance, um, increased demand for, um, you know, access to citizen data, and also um, to this kind of policy moment. I mean, tech companies are beheld to the laws that govern them. So um, what are you seeing from the tech side? Yeah, so tech companies is not a monolith. There are a bunch of different uh, different sides to the to technology world. In terms of the, the huge companies like Apple, it's interesting to notice that Apple is mostly on our, our on society's side in this, where their users uh, want safety and Apple wants to give them safety. And it's actually in Apple's interest to give them safety because if Apple had the ability to watch everything that they're, tell that they're, that they're saying over messaging, uh, then they're a target for people trying to break in and harm the users. So in this sense, uh, we are aligned with groups like Apple. On the other hand, uh, so this, we haven't said the word crypto wars yet. But uh, we have to look at history and we have to look at the fact that, uh, that governments have been asking for weakening security uh, over and over for years. And uh, for example, in the West, for internet routers, like the, 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 the backbone pieces of the internet, uh, each router has a port called a lawful intercept port. And the idea is uh, you go to a judge and you say, I want to be able to watch uh, all the internet traffic going along this part of the internet because there's a, a bad guy and I want to be able to watch him. And the judge uh, thinks about it and says, okay, sounds good. And then you plug into the lawful intercept port and you get to listen to uh, uh, all of the internet traffic there. And I was years ago uh, talking to a group in the German foreign ministry uh, and they were trying to figure out, should we regulate, uh, as Rand was talking about, should we regulate these spyware tools? How do we decide what counts and what doesn't count? And there was an engineer from a Dubai telecom there who's like, you guys put the lawful intercept port in, and when my prince in Dubai asks what that, what's that port, and I say, oh, that's the lawful intercept port, and he says, plug it in. 
Like the, the, the jurisdiction is wildly different, but the tool works the same in Dubai versus the US versus Europe. So uh, part of the, the thing, to, to bring it back to Tate's question, part of the things that the tech companies need to think about here is uh, this is a recurring theme where governments keep asking for more and more access, more and more weakening, and, uh, and there are side effects such as having lawful access ports on backbone internet routers, which can be used well and wisely, and are often not used well and wisely. So uh, every time we think about uh, weakening safety for society, we need to think through uh, where that's gonna go in the future. Yeah, and um, we're just about ready to take some audience questions, but Roger, I wanted to ask you to just expand on that last point before we bring in any audience questions. So have your questions. Um, at the ready. But, you know, when it comes to thinking about this globally, um, as you said, you know, technology doesn't know boundaries. Um, there is this kind of competitive market for both spyware and privacy technology. How do you think about, you know, how might we foster a global approach to uh, a encrypted encryption protecting framework for governance? Again, a big question for you. Yeah. Um so the answer isn't to make all of society less safe. That cannot be the answer. And it is frustrating that the US and the UK and Europe are so excited to do that. And it's especially frustrating at the same time as each of these countries is signing the Freedom Online Coalition, the uh, Declaration for the Future Internet, the Global Compact, all these acronyms we're hearing about at IGF this week. Uh, we've got countries saying that they value s safety for society, yet, uh, yet here they are trying to, to pass these laws um, each year. So, um, yeah, how do we, I guess, so it, it can't be uh, mass weakening. A lot of countries then look at the targeted uh, attacks, the ones that Rand was talking about, where they go to some Israeli company and they buy the ability to break into their specific target's phone and bypass uh, encryption and other mechanisms. And in a sense, that's better. At least it's not mass attacks. At least it's not harming everybody. But the reality there is we keep seeing these targeted attacks being used against not just journalists and bloggers and activists, but French politicians and the, the parliament members in Germany and so on. So that's, I'd like to live in a world where the targeted attacks are the, are the better answer, but that seems like a pretty bad answer also. I guess the, as a technology person, I'm, I'm good at explaining why things won't work, but the, the best solution that I have is uh, we need to maintain strong security for all of society, meaning we need encryption to work well. And as Rand was saying, we need to start uh, regulating and deciding what small arms dealers are allowed to do in the software vulnerability exploit space. And uh, I mean, yeah, we, we could go on and on about this, but I'll, I'll pause for other people to jump in. And I'm gonna do just that because I think for the people who are going to create the regulations, if they don't have a proper, correct understanding of what it is they're regulating, what the impacts of not regulating, regulating in a certain way, regulating completely, if they don't get it, then regulating is going to be a Band-Aid approach. The long term that should have started many, many years ago is education from the youngest grades, not just in how to use a computer, how to use these wonderful devices that do provide convenience for the good among us and the opportunists among us, but educate people about everything from how are laws made, what is democracy, what are different types of political structures. Give them the education so they can make critical decisions and grow up to build systems that don't provide the very same problems we're tackling and struggling with now. Ultimately, yeah. we need to normalize what encryption is. So one great success story is HTTPS. 
it used to be that governments and law enforcement said, but if everybody has encryption when they go to websites, society will collapse. Think of the children. What would happen if we aren't able to watch what you do when you connect to a website? And now, whenever you do your online banking or you log into the IGF website or any website, you use HTTPS. It's normal. They fought that fight. We won. Let's look to that as an example where we need to somehow figure out how to make society safer for the next round also. Yeah, and I want to pass it over to Ron too to get your perspective on this. Like what can we do to take a positive step forward globally? I think the answer is actually quite simpler than many policymakers would like to hear because they would want to know that it's a complicated manner and so use that to not pass uh, progressive laws. But really the international standards that we already have are quite strong. We already have many rights respecting laws and rights pushing laws. And so when we look at international standards for due process, for fair trials, for freedom of expression, et cetera, they already render surveillance capabilities as invasive as they stand right now, illegitimate. You know, uh, surveillance in the sense that would be promoted when encryption is undermined is basically assuming that everyone is guilty until proven innocent, which is the opposite of what should be what should happen. And it brings to the consciousness of the state people who are not guilty of anything. And so it already is sort of a, an unlawful kind of attack. So really what we need to do is be able to enshrine in an international framework what surveillance and encryption means, inspired by the spirit of what we already have, which is strong international protections for our rights as they stand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like the infrastructure approach is something that is increasingly, I don't I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but it feels like that's a similar approach that you're advocating for that um, has also been applied to areas like anti-censorship technologies um, and, um, you know, that space as well. Um, so I want to pause and see, are there any questions either online um, or in the room? If it's online, you can just add them to the chat and in the room, um, please make yourself known and Al will take care of you. We've got some hands in the room. So go to the microphone and yeah, uh, go ask. to the mic and get in line, please. And thank you. Please introduce yourself before your question. That'd be great. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Han Donoslo. I uh, worked for Google at the Trust Fund Safety Function and uh, policy implementation for a while. And then I found a Turkey's Internet Observatory, Gözlemevi. So uh, what I want to ask is I actually have questions for uh, three of you. So for Roger, firstly. So when we talk about protecting human rights activists, we I feel like the conversation is sometimes uh, assuming a functioning democracy and the functioning government that kind of is really willing to protect the citizens. So that really doesn't apply outside of Western Europe and outside of the US. So what we see in here, for example, um, in Turkey, we see that people are, um, so when there is any encrypted app found on someone's phone or someone's uh, c computer, that can be used as, a, as a evidence to support a case that someone is doing something illegal. So if Tor project, if I'm using Tor on my computer, um, that can actually endanger me. Um, so it might be more safe in terms of surveillance, but it's not safe if we talk about the tools of, of oppressive governments, for example. So I was just wondering if you're discussing, um, if you're talking about human rights activism and if you're talking about protecting democracies, is there any context or any information that you ever get on how autocracies work or because the problem is these countries, they learn from each other. So um, any law that pops up in a country is likely to be transferred. And so for example, as someone who works in technology and human rights and democracy, we do not suggest um, some of the telegram or signal. Yes, it is encrypted. Yeah, yes, it's open source, but it might put you in more danger because of this. So that's my question to Roger. I also have a question to Tate, actually. Um, so, uh, so when we see about, the, because uh, I've, I've been following MIT Tech Review, and we do have a lot going on um, in Middle East and in other countries, and what we see is that these are not being reported often. So there might be an issue in the US, and it, it will get a lot of news and presence, but, um, but when the Turkish government or some other government or any government has a big tech request, and this big tech company complies, uh, or, or some other stuff happens, 
these things would get a lot more, uh, I feel like, coverage if it was happening in other countries. But, but like I said, when, when problems happen in a country, it's, it's not just for that country. Uh, it's probably going to be replicated. If there is a law in, popping up in a certain country, for example, against en encryption, it is very likely to be replicated in a similar uh, geography. So I was wondering if um, you have any insights on uh, maybe improving the coverage on just going beyond the Western look on how human rights issues and human rights activists could be protected. And for Sha um, you, uh, sorry, Sharon, Shannon, yes, I, 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 I'm bad at remembering sometimes, but my question is, because you mentioned that you do talk a lot with the government bodies and you are in interaction with them, is what percentage of your work is actually focusing on holding big tech companies accountable? And if that is a perspective, because um, Again, big tech compliance in autocratic governments is growing a lot. And uh, these companies, to earn, uh, they really want to earn a lot of money. And they are willing to give up er every single human right. And um, so, for example, Messenger is encrypted. But we have learned from Facebook officials that they do actually give information, chatting information, uh, once, once it's requested. And these are not requests based off of security reasons. So it's not a request to identify someone who has been missing for a while. Uh, they're mostly politically motivated. So these are my three big questions to you. Thank you. Should we try to answer them now, or should we take more? What's the right way to one at a time? OK, uh, so th you're absolutely right that, uh, that there are not as many functioning democracies in the world as we would like. Um, in fact, if you know a good functioning democracy, please let me know. In terms of uh, the safety of having tools like Tor installed in dangerous places, there's actually a really interesting synergy because Tor is not just for resisting surveillance, it's also for resisting censorship. And in a lot of countries like Iran and now Russia and Turkey and so on, there's a lot of censorship. So the average Tor user in Iran is using it to get to Facebook because they blocked Facebook. And that means the average Tor user in Iran is an ordinary Facebook user who's just using it to get around the censorship. Yes, there are some political dissidents in there, but the average user is an ordinary citizen. And that ordinariness is an important security property for having these tools. And similarly, as the whole world moves to not just Telegram or Signal, but WhatsApp and iMessage, and as more uh, ordinary tools get real encryption, uh, it becomes a normal thing that everybody has, not a sign that you're a political dissident. So that, you're absolutely right, and the tools need to become pervasive and ordinary in order to be safe. I can um, briefly answer the question, and um, also just a reminder so that we can get to all the questions. Um, we can all try to be brief in our responses. Um, thank you so much for that question. It's a very important question. Um, I don't know if I can give you a very satisfying answer other than it shouldn't be that way. Um, and I, as an individual reporter and us as technology review are constantly trying to be better about this. Um, I think, frankly, like you get into all of these issues with journalism and local journalism and journalism business models right now um, and racism and where people pay attention and who people pay attention to. I think those are all parts of the answer to your problem, um, but certainly the press can and should do better um, at covering countries outside of the West. Um, and so thank you for uh, encouraging me to do so and um, feel free to send me tips at any point um, as well and I will uh, do my best to uh, cover international stories more. I appreciate your question. Do we deal directly with the tech companies? No, we tend not to. We deal with um, putting on the record what is going on. So when we spoke to the Canadian Parliament about facial recognition or about spyware, we put on the record the billions of dollars, the statistics from industry as to what sort of uh, co contribution those industries, cybercrime, spyware, what do they contribute to an economy, and often it's larger than some nations' economies, and we put on the record what the impact is. And of course, it's very simple. As you said, companies are not interested in your privacy or mine, 
they are interested in providing the greatest return possible for their shareholders. That is their raison d'etre. So for them to say, and, and this isn't specifying one company or another, for them to say, we take your privacy seriously, we will protect it, I think that's a promise that nobody should try to make because it's inevitably going to fail. Um, we need to see governments recognizing what the problems are, realizing that the tech companies, yes, they certainly do provide employment, innovation, and for perfectly legitimate and wonderful purposes. You know, using AI for medical advancement, that's great. Using AI so I can pay whatever the fee is today to spit into a vial and have my DNA analyzed by a company in the United States that says in their so-called privacy policy online, we will protect your privacy, and then they are breached. This just happened. Uh, and millions of people's genetic identities have been spirited away. You can't change your genetics, you can change your password. Do governments understand? Do the bureaucrats and the lawmakers and the policymakers understand? No. When it happens to them, that I find is when things might start to change. So we do a lot to increase their awareness of these risks. Thank you for these questions and answers. Why don't we get a question from this line here? Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Masayuki from Japan. Uh, I'm academic. Um, this may be a bit extreme, but uh, it's kind of related to the uh, previous question. Um, um, uh, do you have a plan of action for when the backdoor is somehow, I mean, encryption backdoor is somehow uh, mandated? Uh, since we finally avoided the uh, you know, uh, worst with the UK online safety bill, barely, and I think the fight will be continued, especially in Japan or anywhere. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, so do we have a plan of action for when the back doors are really, really required? Is that the question? We will never put a back door in Tor. We will never undermine Tor's security. I don't care what the laws say. So we're going to have to wrestle with whatever the political policy implications of that is. We've got EFF, ACLU, a bunch of uh, legal organizations in Europe and the US and around the world who want to fight these things, and uh, I hope they succeed. We will never weaken Tor security. If I can add to that, I think the most important part is that people are now becoming aware, and I don't mean just people in technology or in the privacy realm or certain policymakers. I mean the general public has gotten fed up with seeing their personal information monetized. They are starting to ask questions. I'm working with some people who are developing systems, so it will completely change the dynamic. No longer will you have to submit to whatever the so-called privacy policy is on a website, you will have control over whether, when, how much, to whom your personal information goes. You will be in control to flip things around. Companies aren't gonna like it, but when the people who are their bread and butter now say, we've had enough, they will have to change how they do it. And that is going, that's going to be a plan of action en masse. So we have four more minutes. I wanna try to get both of these questions in. So if the answers could be brief, that'd be great. Uh, this line next. Hi, <coughs> thank you. Uh, Andrew Campling, I'm a uh, consultant on internet standards and a trustee of the uh, uh, internet, uh, internet Watch Foundation. A Couple of quick comments, I'll try and be brief. Um, we've, in the discussion, the title is about human rights and it's mainly been about privacy. Um, we've largely, until the last answer, ignored surveillance capitalism, um, if we're gonna talk about privacy. Um, we focus on evil governments and it seems to deflect attention from what the tech sector does itself um, to users and arguably that's a lot worse. Uh, we've ignored the rights of the victims of CSAM um, to focus on the rights of others at their expense. And I think we need to acknowledge um, and, and talk about that. 
Um, we're sort of treating privacy as an absolute right, whereas certainly in Europe it's a conditional right. Uh, other human rights are absolute rights. Um, and we often now we're protecting the conditional right of privacy at the expense of the absolute rights of, of people whose other rights are being infringed, such as the CSAM uh, victims. We need to acknowledge that when we have the blind use of encryption, that can weaken uh, privacy. Um, so when you apply encryption to internet uh, protocols, uh, that can actually weaken cybersecurity. And if you don't have good cybersecurity, you have no privacy, even when you think you do. Uh, and I think that's a significant problem. Um, we need to acknowledge that most of the tech companies, and I accept it, not the ones here probably, um, they're not defending my human rights, they're defending their revenues because they're encrypting the data that they're extracting from my uh, endpoint um, to uh, 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 when they surveil me. Um, and they don't want their competitors to access uh, that data. That's why they want the encryption, not to protect my rights. That's an interesting byproduct uh, to, to justify uh, the, the encryption. And, and, and then finally, uh, and, and acknowledging the comment you just gave on, on Tor's position on, on backdoors, almost all of the big tech companies absolutely compromise their uh, approach to privacy in order to have market access in some of those uh, very problematic states. So you don't have a private relay in China um, because it's illegal. Um, but they will cheerfully ignore uh, the, the laws in democracies, um, but uh, will comply with the laws in uh, more autocratic states. And I think that's pretty problematic as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, we could definitely have a session on surveillance capitalism and the evils of large tech companies and how they're attempting to uh, primarily maximize their profit rather than actually caring about their users. Uh, one of the points that we tried to make here is uh, there are some, some synergies, some overlaps where, at least in this case, uh, Apple is interested in privacy, first of all, because it's good for marketing. People ask for it this year, uh, but also because uh, it, it helps them uh, have less surface area for attack so that they don't have as much that they have to worry about for uh, people trying to attack their users. But you're right that that doesn't make Apple great. And it's also an excellent point that, uh, that many tech companies uh, choose to design their approaches with China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, all the, all the other interesting big markets around the world, India, in mind. And that causes them to do bizarre and dangerous things for their users. I think we have like one minute left. So if you could ask your question, hopefully we can fit in an answer. Spinning down. Um, I just want to build on the, the first question really and ask about the mechanics of advocacy in different countries and, and parts of the world. So take one of the examples you, you mentioned was India. And, and I'm just wondering whether there's a sense in which you need to adapt the messaging and, and, and the arguments uh, around this to different parts of the world. Ron, do you want to take that? I feel like you have a good perspective, better than I would, certainly. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a very good point. Of course, uh, you know, using the same narratives within different contexts doesn't always or isn't really fruitful. It's not uh, as productive as you would hope. Of course, when we are trying to do any advocacy within autocratic states that have no regard for human rights, we cannot be using a human rights uh, kind of based argument, which is when you kind of talk about national security and how that is also kind of in the interest of the state or also use economic um, advantages or economic kind of arguments to say, you know, there is business espionage. Um, how do you protect kind of the economic advantages of certain companies, the competitive advantage of certain companies? And that's when, you know, other companies come on board and try to, as you know, as Roger was saying, and try to become allies in this space. And so it is definitely incredibly important to make sure that we're using the appropriate narrative within the advocacy spaces that we are using, but also to be very mindful that, you know, the advocacy avenues in some contexts are just not there. Um, it is really difficult to 
uh, talk about you know a rights respecting framework for the use of surveillance technologies in autocratic uh, governments or even in democracies these days which is why we need to look at it as sort of a more global or international framework because you cannot depend on you know the jurisdiction where this this technology is utilized you know the technology doesn't the, te the infrastructure is there and so we cannot control how well or how bad it, it is utilized and so that's why we need to look at a more international framework for the use. Okay, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for all of your questions, for your comments, uh, to all the panelists and Al for the participation um, in today's panel. I, ho I hope um, you all learned something. I certainly did. And I hope you have a great uh, time at the rest of the day's events.